Chris, the team lead music. We've been making music all day. My ears are still beeping a bit for playing drums. Uh, but I stand in front of you as the director of the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure with my team. So in reverse order, you will be seeing uh, Astrid Ozenbrug here at uh, MCA. Uh, she is uh, officer at the Bar Operations Center and also the chair of uh, the Cyber Operations Center. Uh, but at DFD, she's the chair of the, of the board. Uh, Leonard Oudhorn, uh, here at MCA, is juggling around with a whole lot of zeros. I don't know what it means, but it's very important. And at DFVD, he's the head of CSERT, which is not the Computer Security Incident Response Team for our own organization, but for the whole world. That's where we put our uh, notifications throughout the rest of the world. And if the DFVD itself is in crisis, we have Frank Bredijk, our crisis manager. But here at MCA, he is the chief Officer Balloon Folding, of course, and uh, he's also the super admin of our hyper-intelligent Telex, through which you can send uh, coded messages, and he has been sending musical requests to us on the stage through his Telex, so thank you very much for that. Um, the FED, the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, we scan the whole IP version 4 of the internet, which is quite a lot. And this is the second time we're here. Because if you remember, two days ago, we had the same talk, but in the middle of our talk, somebody pulled an internet cable, and then all the power of the whole plant went down. So we continued offline with all nice Q&A, but you folks at home, you missed the whole talk. So this is take two, so we had a great rehearsal. Uh, but yeah, we're two days later, so we're all a bit worn out. But we'll make the best of it. The Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, this is our mission. We aim to make the digital world safer by scanning the whole internet, reporting vulnerabilities we find in digital systems to the ones who can fix them. So those are mostly the owners of the systems, but sometimes also vendors or their suppliers or their ISPs uh, who put the notification forward. You have this old software running, your configuration is wrong. Please fix it, make it safer. That's what you know, ethical hackers or helpful hackers, how you like to call them, normally do individually to an individual system. We put this on steroids by doing it for the whole internet, with the whole collective, for the whole world. Um, we have a global reach, because we scan the whole internet and we notify, but we do it Dutch style, which means it's very open. We all use our real names. It's not really hacker-like, we don't use pseudonyms. Uh, we also have an office, you can even call us, which is not very typical for a hacker collective. Uh, we do it collaborative, so we work together with many partners. Uh, we don't exclude others. We, we work with everybody just to make the internet safer, like, well, the Red Cross also helps everybody. And above all, we do it for free. We Dutch like free, but it also has a legal consequence why we do it for free. Which brings us to, well, you know, what does it look like, our daily practice? Well, a bit like this. Um, we have our own autonomous system, 50559. So you can recognize us, put us on the allow list, not on the block list, so we can scan you uh, through these uh, IP uh, series. Um, well, we also use Shodan, but from here, we download the whole list of IP addresses for the vulnerabilities we scan on. So typically, there's a CV coming out with a nice number, and we know which version. So we just send the ping to the whole world. Which version are you running? Oh, you have an old version. From the Whois, we look up your email addresses, and then we report to you your R leak. We also have a brand of research where we do zero-day research. So then it's not a known vulnerability, but we already start scanning and warning and try to solve it with the vendor. And once there's a patch, again, we warn the whole world. Um, if you just ask for the, 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 the version of a software, well, uh, th that's no rocket science and that's also legal, but sometimes we need to use, well, sort of non-weaponized exploits to scan your system. And that's probably where things might become a bit taggy. 
are you allowed to scan the whole internet? Well, nobody asked you to do so. Nobody allowed you to do it. Uh, in the strict sense, it's illegal. We kind of violate all sorts of computer fraud laws. We also kind of violate the GDPR, because all those lists with IP addresses and email addresses, those people never ask us to use them. And moreover, we also hand them to others. So why do we get away with it? Check our code of conduct. Um, it's on the website, it's two pages, but these are the three most important principles, which are not just something we made up, but something which comes out of case law in the Netherlands, but also international. Because you can commit a kind of computer fraud slightly if you do it for societal need. So if you're not being paid for it, or you do it out of revenge or to prove yourself, no, you just do it to help. There's no financial incentive. And you see that, well, there's, there's this huge need. Because if we don't, these people remain vulnerable, and then the computer uh, criminals get in there, and it's even worse. And also, we well, kind of violate your privacy slightly in order to prevent a much larger privacy invasion. So therefore, the societal need is, in several court cases, the first thing a judge looks at. You know, did you do it just to help people? Yes. But if that, that is established, the judges look further, because you can't just hack anything, saying, oh, yeah, it's for the good cause, so yeah, I broke it down, blah, 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 and yeah, that their system is not running anymore, what's well, their fault because it well, was broken anyhow? No, you can't do that. There comes in the principle of proportionality. So the means you use to order to achieve this goal is it in proportion to what you try to achieve. So again, you can, well, for example, try uh, to reset an account on admin or info uh, just to see whether the procedures are right. But if you start to reset 100,000 accounts and the system goes down, well, you proved it's not really safe, but it's a too harsh a measure. Uh, also, um, if we cannot just scan for a version, but we need to use non-weaponized exploits, as if you know, you're hacking them, the exploits shouldn't ruin the system. You're there to make it safer, not unsafer. So if you have established that, you have a sort of proof of concept that you can scan for good, and it is proportional to what you're trying to achieve, you reverse the process, and that's the principle of subsidiarity. Okay, this is what we want to achieve, this is the means we found for it, this is the scanning method, but can we also use another method which is less invasive? So, for example, you can enter a database. You can look around, of course, see what's in there, establish, well, it's a true database, it's actual, it's running, but please just make a screenshot of, of the folders and go. Don't start downloading all of this data, because you don't need it. It's not proportional, and there are less severe means to use it, subsidiarity. So, so much for the legal, ethical stuff, the boring stuff. Now we go to the part where you all came for, the case studies, <laughs> the kind of researches we did. So we take you back in time, a year. Remember the, the 2nd of July, the biggest ransomware attack ever took place in the world on Kaseya VSA. These criminals thought they could, well, hack about a million organizations with the ransomware, but what they didn't know then was that DRVD was already two months on the case. And as this is a crisis, I will now hand it over to our crisis manager, Frank. Thank you. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Kaseya. Um, as Miko said, um, yeah, it was one of the biggest cases we've, we've ran up until now. Uh, well, that was my line before I started talking about SolarMan. Um, but it's actually a case that started off with Vitsa on our right, who's here in a picture with, uh, with Victor, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, due to some health issues. Victor, love you, would like to have you here, but uh, yeah, get well. Um, Kaseya Feza's case 2021-0011. Um, yeah, and how did it begin? Well, uh, Vitsa Boonstra, He's sitting over there. He's a penetration tester by day and a DIVD and we member by night, as, as Jambos would put it. And he was doing a pen test of a customer and encountered a product called Kaseya VSA. And as he was poking around on the network, trying to find a way in, trying to find a way to, to get to his flags, 
um, is like, hmm, this doesn't sit well with me. I think there's more to have, but I'm running out of time. So Richie being Richie, he took the software home, installed it in his lab, and um, started playing with it. And was it safe? Well, not really. Um, initially, we found around seven uh, CVEs, um, 3116, a credentials leak and a business logic flaw. Uh, credentials leak in the sense that you could log on, you could get to the system, say, hey, I want to install my, I want to install my agent. Uh, you would get an installer file. If you installed the agent, there was an ini file, and in the ini file, there were credentials to log in, and those credentials were um, credentials for an agent, but you could use them for much more. Uh, we also found an authenticated SQL injection vulnerability, a way to write into the database. Um, I think it was a blind one, so you couldn't actually get data out, but you could get data into the database. An unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability, uh, several cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, I think we all lumped them together. Um, they thought it was smart to handle two-factor authentication on the client side. Uh, it isn't. Uh, then we found a local file inclusion vulnerability in the agent, well, we uh, reach, and an XML entity, external entity uh, attack. And that gave two theoretical attack paths. Uh, one, where you do the authentication bypass, then you use the SQL injection to actually write jobs in Kaseya, because this is a system administration tool, so you could write jobs to, uh, to say, you know what, um, install a crypto miner. And I vividly remember joking around saying, hmm, or, or not really joking around, I was like, like huh, I wonder, this could be big. You know, this is managed service providers, they have customers, usually managed service providers have 10, 100 customers. Customers have 10, 100, 1,000 pieces, 1,000 systems that are, ooh, this could be a lot of systems. And then we said, well, if we do an authentication bypass and then an SQL injection, we can look into the database and find out how many clients, how many systems this is. And then we said, well, if we do that, we might as well install a crypto miner on all those things. And it's like, okay, this is where we stop. Something about ethics and proportionality and subsidiarity, all the boring stuff that Chris talked about. Um, later on, we also found a remote code execution that was unauthenticated, which was um, yeah, even, even scarier, I guess. Um, yeah, and with writing that job in the database, you could actually let those clients do anything. As soon as they pulled Kaseya VSA, they would do whatever job you gave them. So what did we do? Well, what do you do? We, first of all, we disclosed to Kaseya, and Kaseya has been very cooperative with us. Uh, I think it was two days later or a day later that we were in a call with the CTO who was really scared that we were an American party that would give them 30 days to fix everything and then everything would be published. Uh, yeah, I don't think that makes the internet more safe. Uh, if you want to have that debate, let's do it outside with a beer. Um, they had a strong focus on fixing it. They asked us several times to retest findings once they, uh, once they fixed it. Um, in the meantime, we could build an NSE script, a, an NMAP script to scan for exposed Kaseya instances. And we could scan there because there was an open API endpoint. And that open API endpoint kindly sent back the IP address it was running on, which version it was running, and a customer code. And that was a four-digit customer code or four-letter customer code that Kaseya knew which customer it was. And that turned out to be quite handy. We found about 2,200 Kaseya instances. Remember each having about 100 times 100, 10,000 systems connected to it? Maybe. We never actually found out, but it was huge. And we didn't do a disclosure at that point in time. Because at that point in time, if we would have done a disclosure, we were afraid that this would lead to a very significant ransomware campaign. So fast forwarding to the 2nd of July. I was sitting by the campfire with my group of scouts. I'm a member of, uh, of scouts, so I feel very at home here uh, among the hackers and the scouts. And you know you're in trouble when you walk away from the campfire and you've missed uh, 30 calls and got about 90 messages. 
Um, Vitz had a similar experience. He's, he's got a ping from, uh, from Kaseya. It's like, hey, can you come online in a meeting? And he opens up his desktop. For some reason, he had LinkedIn open. I don't think you're searching for a job anymore. Um, and there was like this news article, ransomware attack on Kaseya FASA. OK, fuck. Um, so we started a crisis call. And then we remembered, yeah, but we have a list of exposed VSA instances. Now, we do need to verify it was about a month old then. Um, we did send out notifications, hey, you're likely running Kaseya VSA. It's a good idea to, do it, uh, to, to not connect it to the internet anymore. We provided a list of services to Kaseya. We helped them with the crisis management. We helped them with their decision to take the system, the SaaS service offline. We started a new scan with ZMAP and that NMAP and that NSE script and we rinsed and repeated. And then our then CISO um, was like, fuck, did they attack us? Did they get the exploits from us? Uh, well, they did something differently, it turned out. They are using the same authentication bypass that we found, but they were using a different vulnerability, which was a file upload vulnerability. Arbitrary file upload, then called a file, which called for local file inclusion, file ex code execution, and then update the task list and install ransomware everywhere. And by the way, they do get went for money. Um, the other reason why we think they never hacked us is, well, A, a thorough investigation. Thank you uh, for that. The other part was we had this more nasty exploit here on the top. We had a direct remote code execution would, would have made this attack so much more efficient from their perspective and so much more hurtful for us. It worked, as in... The number of Kaseya instances in our baseline scan one and two was about 2,200. Overnight, it dropped to about 600. Then it dropped during the day to about 50. And on the 4th of July, obviously on the 4th of July, I remember having calls with people who were on boats with barbecues in the background. Um, it even dropped lower. Part of these things went offline because they got crypted. And, and companies were in panic mode. Others went offline because we told them so. And I actually got the feedback like, yeah, 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 this is the third time we're being called to take it offline. It was just a system to see what happens. We're taking it offline. And on the 4th of July, there were no Kaseya VSA systems online in the Netherlands at all. But it also didn't. Because Co-op Supermarket in Denmark had to close down 500 stores. Uh, about 1,500 organizations got their entire businesses crypted, were crippled. Which reminds me of Miko's tweet, uh, Miko's tweet uh, from a while back. Rarely has every, anyone been thanked for the work they did to prevent a disaster that didn't happen. We were planning to do that. We failed and we got thanked profusely. Uh, why wasn't the SaaS version affected? Because there's also a SaaS version of Kaseya, VSA. Well, because it doesn't have the authentication bypass. They use a different method. Everything else worked but the authentication bypass. So if we would have been hacked, the disaster would have been a lot bigger. So one of the things we got challenged on is, is the long way to exposure. Why didn't we disclose earlier? Um, like I said, we had better exploits than Revo. Um, it would have worked on the SAS version 2. They would have made a bigger disaster. But we did learn to be more firm on vendors. Because if you wait too long, you'll be the next. If you get a call from us that there's a problem with your product, it's kind of nice if you listen. It had a very satisfying ending in the sense that the Reefle Ransomware gang was arrested in Russia, um, which is all the better. Um, but yeah, and it put us on the map, which leads me to the second case, Leonard. No mic? Uh, hello? Yeah, it works. All right. Like you can see on the screen, um, 
Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to talk about two different cases that were quite unique for us, and that's why I think they're interesting to talk about. Um, they're the global charities and our global healthcare case. Uh, like Chris told you earlier, we're usually scanning for known uh, CVEs or in the case of Kaseya, working with vendors to disclose our own zero-day research, but these two are different. The cases we ran were 39 in 2021, and we've already surpassed that number in 2022, so we're working really hard at that. And we were happily chugging along with that, and then this happened. A cyber attack on the Red Cross where uh, data of vulnerable people was in danger. So the cyber attack happened because of an unpatched server, and the server happened to be Manage Engine from Zoho. And at that point, we were like, huh? we know this name. Have we looked at this? Did we not look at this? Why would, wasn't this prevented by us? So we looked back and we were like, hey, we did make a Slack channel for this. We looked into it. But sadly, it turned out that there was no benign way to scan for this vulnerability without very high chance of harming the systems. So we couldn't scan for it and warn the users which made us quite sad because we really wanted to help. Um, but in helping, of course, we have to follow our code of conduct. We're not for hire. We don't target individual organizations. So at this moment, we had to be a little hacky of our own code of conduct. And instead of targeting a single organization we wanted to help, like the Red Cross, we decided to scan all the charities and healthcare providers we could find. This resulted in two new cases which you can see here, our global charity vulnerabilities and our global healthcare vulnerabilities cases. And this was for us an entirely new approach because usually we send an email and then for a commercial party, hey, you know now, you are aware, please fix, it's your responsibility. But we really cared about these NGOs and charities and all the good work they are doing. So we really wanted to help them, give them a bit more aftercare, really chase down the fixes, do the follow-up, and for a change, we were not scanning for a single vulnerability, but we were scanning for all the things we could find that would put these organizations at risk. So we did it. We managed to help them find a lot of vulnerabilities, get a lot of them resolved, receive nice thank you messages, and then you think, we're done. No, we're not done now. Because what's next? We have these lists of IP spaces and domains that we can now link to these organizations whose work we find so important. So in any new case that we run, we can check our list of results for these organizations and give them the same aftercare that we did in these two unique cases. And that's how we'll be uh, moving forward, trying to help these organizations that also do their best to make the world a better place. Because we think it's really needed, as we see, definitely see a pattern in these organizations that they're so busy doing the good work, or in cases of charities and NGOs, not always have the funds to do cybersecurity well. And that's a pattern we're seeing in various cases. And one of these different cases is the Zimbra case, which Frank will now tell you a bit more about. Yeah, Zimbra. Um, Zimbra was a different case. It was one of those cases where we looked for something that was already being explode, exploited. Um, and with Zimbra, it was a cross-site scripting that was used in Operation Email Thief. Um, the dear people at Velexity who do some excellent work every now and then um, actually identified a campaign in which an attacker first sent a reconnaissance mail, then a couple of days later sent another mail if the account was actually active. And if somebody clicked on the mail while being logged into Zimbra webmail, that link would successfully redirect to a URL, and all your email would go to their CNC server. All of it. So Zimbra is a product that's like Outlook or Exchange. It's a groupware product, uh, email client, scheduling, uh, those kind of things. And it had a lot of potential victims. Well, back on that first date, the 14th of December, there were roughly 65,000 Zimbra servers in the IPv4, first IPv4 space um, that were all vulnerable. 
And there were things like European government bodies, media, universities, uh, Ukraine government and uh, ISPs, Russian government bodies. Um, those kind of organizations are important. Data getting stolen from universities is not a good thing generally. Uh, on the 7th of February, the number of vulnerable servers was reduced to 31,000 because at that point in time there was actually a patch. Some people could patch. Um, but this was still exploited in the wild. That number went down on the 14th of February to about 24,000. And then it stabilized on the 14th of March. But we're not really sure if it stabilized. Because it turned out that there were two ways to upgrade your Zimba server. One is chuck it away, get a new one, install the new software. The other one was a hotfix. And that hotfix did fix the vulnerability, but didn't change the version number in the front end. So we were doubtful if those numbers that we were seeing were actually vulnerable clients. So at that point in time, we decided, OK, we're not going to continue on this path. We did some research. We couldn't find any more reliable way to do, ver to do fingerprinting. Uh, and that was the end of this talk. With that, I'm going to give it over to uh, Astrid. And uh, while it's Astrid is coming here, it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those cases where you end up not on high, uh, <laughs> but with a little bit of info. Yeah. I was just listening to your talk, and I was yeah, but it's really your talk impressed. Too. So uh, I only have two hands, and now I have three things. So, well, hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something really exciting about governance. Who doesn't want to know anything about governance? Let's see how this works. I'm going to tell you a little story. It started somewhere in winter 42. No, I'm just kidding. It started with a man with a dream. His name, his nickname is OX Dude. I don't know if you know, ever heard of this guy. It's Victor Gevers. I hope you can see the stream now because last time I gave a big shout out to you. Victor is uh, well, he's getting better at the moment, so he can't be here, but Victor, we love you, we miss you, we're very proud of you, and I'm going to tell the story about uh, DIVD. We, they call it uh, Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Dis Disclosure. I call it, this is Victor's dream, this is Victor's dream because it all started with this dude. So please, a big shout out, a big hand out to Victor. We miss you, we love you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm not gonna cry this time, so I'm just gonna tell the story. Uh, because Victor started this whole dream um, in his own way, like, he took a sabbatical, not in 2014, 2015, or 2017, no, in 2016, because it was a leap year, so there was one more day, 360 days, and he could find vulnerabilities. He did, he did a lot, I don't know the number, but it's really big, and this is how it all started. Uh, and then he wanted to make his dream bigger, and he asked Chris and me to help him, and well, then Frank came, Leonard came, and then hundreds, no, I say hundreds, but hundred volunteers came, and this is how we became this bunch of nice people. Uh, we have a sub supervisory board, we have a board, we have a director, we have a management team, and 100 volunteers. We are looking all happy here, so, um, well, I think we are. So now you can see this beautiful picture about how we thought about how you make a good volunteer organization. What do you want to do? You want to make sure your volunteers are happy. So uh, we have a board, we have a, su a supervisory board who tells us to, oh, take care of this and don't do that. And then we do it anyways because we are a bunch of hackers. And we also have our director, uh, Chris, who never uh, done this before, so that is why we wanted him. 
we have a research, we have C-cert, we have operations, we have HRM, communication, finance, compliance. It almost sounds like a real company, but still it's built with people who never done this before. And we are doing a fucking awesome job, just saying. Then the next step we decided to start is the academy, because we have a lot of youngsters who want to become a, a hacker. Um, but well, <laughs> sometimes you have to teach them how to do it in an ethical way. And this is what we call the advanced kitten herding. Uh, which, uh, we have a big dream with the uh, DIVD Academy. We also have a board there. And I have to say, we are a real uh, own foundation since two days. So I'm very happy to announce it finally worked. Barry van Kampen, also known as Fish, and Victor Geves, also known as Zero X Dude, and me are the founders. We have a hell of a board. We have Max, he's so, sitting somewhere there. We have Sharesh, and we have Barry as the, the chair. And our, what we really want to do is to teach our youngers, uh, youngsters, because we, we are all getting old, not me, but other people are getting old. And we want to learn them the stuff. They, they have the skills. They don't learn it at school. They want to make the world a better place. DIVD wants to make the world a better place. We need our youngsters to start learning stuff like this. So we thought, well, we're just going to hack the school system. We're going to build our own school. That's the DIVD Academy. I can tell for hours about that, but I'm not going to bore you anymore. If you want to mo uh, know more, just ask me. This is a very important thing also, because we are, like Chris told, uh, the, uh, the IVD, we do it in a Dutch way, we're focusing on Dutch, whatever, and then we found out we need our peers around the world, like in every country, we really need a DIVD who do the same stuff. So we started CSERT Global with Ewart uh, Driehuis. I'm not sure his talk was already tomorrow, or tonight, at 11. Uh, Chris is going to tell you more about that, but this is really important, because we need to grow, 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 to make the internet a safer place for all of us, for our youngsters, for myself. I want to be, one day when I'm really old, I'm still very young, I want to be on the internet and enjoy. Information wants to be free, I want to be free, I want to talk to everybody I know in a safe way, and I think we at DIVD, we can handle that. Is this the moment I give you the microphone? Oh, look at our tent. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna, <laughs> yes. That will do. So this was the boring part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't need, it. need the clicker, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you Astrid. Um, yeah, so you can see us here across uh, the abacus. This is our tent. Uh, you probably saw the, the lawnmower. Yes, uh, Wietse also hacked that one. Uh, well, not only this device, but the online platform. So he's now sending all these lawnmowers here to MCH. If you see him approaching at the gate, again, it's, it is uh, Wietse. Uh, you can come there if you want to join the IVD as a researcher or a researcher. And if you want to build up your own chapter uh, in your country, uh, Ewa Driaars will be uh, giving a talk tonight at 11 o'clock. Uh, we already are setting up a chapter in the US and the UK. And these chapters, they actually translate our findings to the local context. So you can imagine that if we have a list of IP addresses uh, on the US, say, we can send them emails, but they don't know what the IVD is. And they might think, well, it's fraud or, you know, a bunch of criminals. If there's organizations in the US, they can also translate it to, to their uh, constituencies on what this actually means. They can also interpret it. Um, researchers from the US can also work with us through CSERT Global, uh, so we can kick off a scan with their methods, etc. I'm really looking forward to a German chapter, so this is my cry out to uh, the, all the wonderful Germans helping out on MCH. I know vulnerability disclosure is very difficult in Germany, especially compared to the Netherlands, but we need to. 
And this is also my call to, to the Belgium uh, colleagues, because vulnerability disclosure in Belgium is much easier. But we might, might need some translation, French, something like that. And we're also working on Sweden and Japan. So hopefully uh, more countries uh, will join. 10.40. 10.40, not 11. Ah, 10.40, very well, because then he's just finished before uh, Symphony of Fire is starting. I know everybody wants to go there, so join Edward his talk. Um, so you can join us in the tent uh, to talk vulnerability disclosure, become a member. Uh, you can do all sorts of jobs on communication, on legal, setting coffee or you know, new logo design, stuff like that. Uh, and it's fun to do. So if you want us online, you can do it. So and if you join us, we can answer questions here, but also questions from the internet for the people at home. Are there questions from the internet? Maybe later. Oh. <laughs> right, we have one. Ah, oh, we have a question here, so go, go ahead. Um, my question is, do you have plans for IPv6? And if so, what are they? Sorry? Do you have plans for IPv6? And if so, can you tell us what they are? Plans for IP version 6? Yeah. Well, yeah, we can't run, just run a scan on IP version 6 because it's too large, but do we have any, any workarounds to, to involve that? Uh, well, well, one of the reasons we're here is, is because there's a great bunch of brilliant minds here. Um, one of the obvious solutions would be to ask everybody what your IPv6 range you actually use and, and, and give it to us to scan. Unfortunately, that means we're, we're really scanning for higher company then, and so ethically we can't go there. Um, otherwise, I think the plans are yeah, well, a bit hard. We do. We are aware of the problem. That's a good start. Real actionable <laughs> plans right now, no. It's just too large to scan the entire space. But there would be options like looking at which blocks are announced, etc., to reduce the space that you need. Uh, we're also in touch with an amazing PhD researcher in Glasgow who does her master thesis about this. So. We're aware of the problem, and we're looking how we're going to scale up and how we deal with it. But for now, most servers still have an IPv4 address, so we can just get by like we do right now. Yeah, plus, if it's not that we don't care about IPv6, if we come across in Shodan something in the IPv6 range and we can, uh, can, can inform people, we will. Uh, but it's just too big to scan, or Shodan, or, or other senses, or, or other data. Um, so if, or if a DNS points to, uh, to IPv6, we'll also uh, include it. But it's just yeah, too big to scan for now. OK, thank you. Yeah, so if you want our scans, you want to be safe, don't use IPv6. <laughs> no, yeah, just a joke. Do use IPv6. <laughs> it's time that we start using this thing that's been around for years. Yes. Do, do we have another question at the back? Yes. Now, uh, first of all, thanks for all your good work. I think uh, DIVD helps a lot of people. And, um, but my question is, I see on the internet, uh, because of the privacy regulations, that uh, email addresses and these contact details get most of the time redacted. How are you even um, able to find the email addresses to, uh, to the companies where that IP address or the domain name belongs after that is redacted? Or does it make your work harder? Yeah, so, so, so the internet, unlike camp, has very poor signage. Um, you can wander around and never know whose village you're in or which camp you're stumbling in, and, and there's not always helpful hints there. Um, those companies that keep their Whois database up to date with their abuse address, thank you very much, that really helps. Um, security TXT is going to help, especially the DNS version is going to help us a lot. Because we don't just want to see your website, we want to use DNS to, to do a reverse lookup and, and get security information there. Um, sometimes it's, it's guessing. Uh, there's countries where, uh, so, so in Af uh, if you look at the ethnic database, there's a lot of uh, IP addresses that just have a telephone number for abuse. Um, yeah, I don't have the time to call all African ISPs. Um, yeah, so. Please keep your who is records up to date. Please put a security text in. Uh, that really, really helps us. 
Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, you were in the news uh, a couple of days back uh, regarding the uh, solar panel uh, stuff, right? Yes, correct. Uh, so yesterday. Uh, the, oh, yesterday. Oh, great. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, it's of course uh, very scary stuff and uh, many thanks for all the hard work in that. Um, my question is, uh, are you any plans for other uh, converters to check? <laughs> uh, <laughs> which ones do you have? <laughs> I have uh, three uh, good weeks. <laughs> uh, so, so, so obviously this topic has our attention. Um, on the other hand, um, we're, we're limited by the number, the amount of time we have. Uh, we are doing competitor research. Uh, we're not after certain vendors. Uh, Solomon just happened to be the unlucky one that we found first. Um, and um, yeah, I guess the state of IoT security would be another talk on itself. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, and Frank already did. So if people are viewing at home and think, what is this about? Look at the internet outage technology, you called it, right? Yeah. Internet, uh, international outage technology. International outage technology. And it was, uh, well, we, we discovered a management panel for many uh, converters and um, yeah, it needed to be closed off because well, you can do nasty stuff with that. So if you want to watch back that, that talk, it's, it's available uh, now. Yes. Uh, you already gave a uh, uh, plan on expanding, on going abroad and uh, yeah, distributing DFAD to other countries. If we speak again in five years, uh, what, what things would you have uh, to see, yeah, what would you like to see that happened or where you stand then? I think that's a question we all might answer. Shall I kick off? Yep. In, in five years, we have grown from 100 to several hundred researchers to do all the work we need to do. So each high high is being scanned in a sufficient manner and also reported to the whole world. So we need more researchers, more CSERT people to do that. Uh, also, that it, it is still a voluntary organization but uh, yeah, th that these people are committed to stay with us. Three is that uh, each country in the world has its own chapter and, and forwarding our findings too. We're already building in the Netherlands our own network of trusted information sharing partners who put our notifications to their constituencies. So like through internet service providers, we had ZCERT for, for healthcare, we have DTC for uh, small medium enterprise, we have the National Cybersecurity Center for the government. Uh, that model might be exported to other countries, uh, helping about, so it's not only our effort, but other countries are helping too. And I hope that in five years we still exist and that we didn't have a court case which, which bankrupted us. So those are my four visions for the coming five years. Um, Astrid, what is your vision for the coming five years for DFVD and also, of course, the Academy? Uh, well, my vision is uh, we will grow and uh, the same points you gave, but also that everybody uh, will recognize us and know we are the good guys and girls and people. We are the good people, I must say. For the Academy, I really want to be a real uh, school where kids can be happy, uh, if you put a fish and a monkey in front of a tree and you say to the fish, climb the tree, then you know it will never happen. But the fish has also very good skills. So that's what we want to do with our kids, our youngsters, to tell them they're good enough for this world. They are fucking smart. We're going to teach them to use their skills in an ethical way and we're going to make sure they become our new generation of pen testers. That is my dream, that is Victor's dream, I know. We also want to make sure that people who are sitting at home at the moment uh, don't get a job because they have different skills. We want to make sure they get the jobs they love, they need, and we need them. So that's my vision for the future. It's more about people. Uh, and we're gonna make sure that we hack our way into the next generation mm. because we re somebody has to do it so we will do this mm. anyone so, else Le Le Leonard, in five years well then probably people are fed up with me and you'll be the director of the ivd so wh where does the ivd stand in I, five I years? was going to start with in five years i hope to do less managing and more hands-on <laughs> hacking again but <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> no i think in five years that um 
I really hope we are reaching, uh, having global reach and having a better way of re um, reaching potential victims. Because right now the abuse at the we rely a lot on ISPs forwarding our message. And some of them do, and some of them just refuse to work with us, which is a shame because it means we don't reach certain people. So I really hope we can uh, find a solution to that part of the problem. Yeah. So, so being the crisis manager, um, I'm going to hope for the best and plan Did you have for a boring worst? job. <laughs> um, I'm going to hope for the best, and I hope that in five years we're going to stand here and say that the IVD is going to be reduced to just the academy, because we were able to do zero cases in the in, in the last five years, or in the last year. Um, failing that, I think we have a lot of ways to do to make that signage on the internet better. To um, right now, scanning is a batch process, so we scan. There's a lot of verification, messages re relayed, and then they go to your ISP or your colo provider or your network provider who might give it to your colo provider who might give it to their customer who's the customer of another customer, uh, and then the message may never get there. And I hope that we can in the Netherlands build an infrastructure to automatically get these things there in minutes from us detecting there's something wrong, uh, and hoping to expand that, that infrastructure globally so that people really get notified, hey, you have a problem, uh, really, really soon. Uh, so that we can do more cases, reach more people, and, and maybe focus on finally fixing IPv6. <laughs> okay. cool. and, uh, actually, I've, I've got a lot of questions. At the moment, this is very much seems a labor of love and that you've Put in and grown up and passionate about what you do, do you do you feel confident about being sorry? Do you feel confident about your uh, funding and sustainability going forward? Well, I, I would rather turn it around. Uh, at the FED, many researchers are already doing this job, and joining us, you know, it's a huge relief to see other people doing the same, and you help each other out. So, so DFED is not only an environment where we try to make the internet safer, but also improve ourselves by learning from each other. Uh, but yes, sustainability is difficult. We do have some, some funding, both from governments, charity funds, to get a little payment for a management layer, but also for all our expensive IT stuff we need. But then again, uh, each time we try to buy a new server or a license, uh, they say, oh, you're a DFD, here's for free, go. Uh, but bottom line is that if, if we don't have any money, we'll, we'll still be doing it. So yeah, I'm pretty confident for sustainability. That is, we might get into a difficult case, for example, like with Solarman. Uh, it might turn into a court case. I hope not, because, well, I hope people see that it's necessary what we do. Any other comments on sustainability? Well, I think, I think sustainability for me, I think if you do something you truly believe in are, you can, do, you can go on for a while. I work. A job. I work for the IVD, but it doesn't feel like work. It feels like I get to be who I am, and that, for me, is the most important part of of of, of what I do. Yeah, I agree with Frank here, and like Chris said as well, a lot of us have been doing responsible disclosure anyway, and we would still be doing it without David A. Or so if David A lacks the funding, we'll just continue doing what we do and keep doing David A because we started without a lot of funding as well. Yeah. It will make your job a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Chris, Astrid, Frank, um, and sorry, Leonard. <laughs> Get my pronunciations right. Um, thank you very, very much indeed.